Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be going over the King's Gambit, beginning after e4, e5, pawn to f4 begins the King's Gambit, and more specifically we're going to be covering the declined variation of the King's Gambit, beginning with this move bishop to c5. So anyways, if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So the declined variation, bishop c5, it's actually super logical uh, as a move goes. I actually recommend this for people that are trying to face the king's gambit with the black pieces. It's trying to take advantage of the fact that white just played pawn to f4, and he weakened this diagonal uh, that his king is going to need to use to get castled. So it's going to effectively prevent castling, and also there's going to potentially be some additional threats. For example, white can't just play the move f captures e5 because we have this check coming in with queen h4 check, and then fg3, we're going to have queen takes e4 check, which is going to attack the queen and attack the rook on h1, which would win material. So f takes e5 is not possible. So if we're playing the white pieces here, how exactly do we face this move? What should we do? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to play knight f3. We need to not only put additional pressure on this e5 pawn, but we need to cover that check square. We need to actually threaten to play f takes e5, or we don't have to worry about queen to h4 check. And that's the critical threat that we're trying to block. So here, black should just hold the pawn. He should play pawn to d6. And he's basically reiterating that threat of, hey, if you play f takes e5, and then d takes e5, if you abandon the h4 square with your knight by playing knight takes to e5, we're going to now have queen to h4 check, g3, queen takes e4 check, and black is going to have a winning position. So here, what should white play? Well, the primary problem in this position is that this bishop is covering this very critical diagonal. This is preventing us from castling. It's preventing us from getting a rook to the f file and getting our king to safety in a way that is logical. Once we played pawn on f2 to f4 and we created this central tension between the f pawn and the e pawn, we're basically making the statement that our ideal is to get castled to king's side and get some attack down the f file and this bishop right now is effectively preventing it. So what we need to do is something that allows us to either block this diagonal or get rid of this bishop. So because of that, there's really only two moves that are super logical here as white. And those two moves are either knight to c3, which has the idea of playing knight a4 and going after the dark squared bishop, after which we'll be able to do everything that we want to do. We'll be able to play d4, we'll be able to develop our last piece, we'll be able to castle because the g1 square will no longer be under black's control. And the other move is to play pawn to c3, with the idea of simply playing c3 and d4 and getting a pawn duo in the middle of the board, but more importantly, blocking this diagonal that the c5 bishop is on. We're blocking the diagonal that the bishop is using to prevent us from castling and to prevent us from improving our position. So now here, black's best move, and I almost never see this move at the club level, is retreating this bishop with the move bishop to b6. This is a move that we sort of call a prophylaxis move, or a preventative measure. And the reason that we play bishop b6 in a position like this is because that bishop was going to get attacked with tempo. As soon as we play pawn to d4, that move is with tempo. And black would rather remove that bishop from that tempo gaining move that white is going to play than make some other developing move. And this is a really hard concept for club players to understand. And that's why I only see strong players play this move, people that actually know the theory. Usually people that are above 2,000 are the only people I see play a move like bishop to b6. Because if you make some other developing move here, then things start happening with tempo. For example, if we play knight to f6, we're going to play d4 with tempo, e takes d4, c d4, and then when this bishop retreats, we play e5 with tempo, and everything in the middle of the board just happened with tempo. This position should simply be advantage white. Another way that this could go is we could develop the other knight. We could play knight to c6, and we have pretty much the same problem. We're doing this with tempo, and then after e takes d4, we're going to have c takes d4, bishop to b6, and now the threat is for black to play pawn to d5. Now, of course, we could play d5 herself, but this would defeat the purpose of blocking this diagonal in the first place, which is we want this diagonal blocked with this pawn on d4 so that eventually we can finish our development and castle. So if we move the d-pawn, we lose our ability to do that. So what we need to do is play knight to c3, which effectively controls the d5 square while keeping that bishop on b6 blocked by the pawn on d4. And then after black makes another normal developing move like knight f6, we're going to play pawn to e5, and this should also be advantage white. Now, interestingly enough, I do have a couple of games from here. 
Uh, we have several games that have continued, D takes E5 and then F takes E5. And all of these games ended up in major or decisive advantage white, because at this point, everybody moved the knight on F6, which has got to be the most logical move ever. I've got a game where somebody played knight G4, and I've got another game where somebody played uh, knight to D5. But according to the engine, the best move in this position is the wild-looking castle's kingside. Just giving up the knight on f6, not moving it at all. And so I don't have a single game in this, so I don't know if you're ever going to encounter it. If you do encounter it, it's somebody that's got some pretty good preparation, because only stockfish spit it out. That's the only thing that I found that, that gave castle's kingside as the best move. But I do have a computer line here just in case, just in case you need to know what is the best thing to play against this. Well, for starters, we should take the knight, and then rook e8, and then we should play bishop e2, and now they're going to play knight takes d4. And now at this point, this position actually becomes really instructive on how to handle positions like this. White is up a piece, but he has no clear way to get his king out of the middle of the board, because again, that bishop is again controlling that ever crucial diagonal from the b6 square to the g1 square preventing us from castling preventing us from getting our king to safety and of course we're a long ways off from getting our king over to the queen side so what do we do in these situations what's the strategy well the strategy when you're getting attacked and your king is in the middle of the board is you no longer kind of have a strategic strategy anymore you're not just like trying to castle or trying to attack one side of the board or place your pieces in a certain area your strategy is to do what I like to call chop wood. Just get the material off the board. Trade. Trade everything you can and just keep offering trades because the less stuff Black has, the less likely it is that he'll be able to do something mean or evil or deliver checkmate. So the first move should just be knight, knight takes d4. We just want to trade. Just get everything off. And then after bishop takes d4, the next move, when you realize that your plan is I have to chop wood, the next move actually becomes really obvious. The next move should be knight to d5. So we're threatening to take that bishop, but also if the bishop moves, all of our problems are gone because then we're going to exchange queens. And once the queens come off, all the danger is gone and we've got nothing to worry about. So black has to actually come up with a creative move here. He has to continue to sacrifice material and play really aggressively. The best move according to Stockfish is queen to d5, giving up that bishop on d4, which again, our goal is to get rid of stuff. So we should definitely take it. We should play knight takes d4. And now we're going to have queen to g2, which threatens the rook on h1. And at this point, we need to start running with our king. We need to just start running king to d2. And then we have bishop to g4. And now rook g1 is the best move, just lining up our rook with the bishop. Rook e2 check is the best move according to Stockfish. And it wasn't until uh, this move gets played, king to c3, that Stockfish finally noticed that white had a major advantage. Up until now, Stockfish kept giving the position as equal or close to equal, and finally when King C3 got played, it realized that there was no way for Black to actually break through and that the White King was going to make it to safety, and White is somehow still miraculously up a piece. Uh, so this is the path that you have to go down. It's relatively forced. And uh, just to finish off this line, uh, Stockfish gives Rook to C2 check, and then of course the Queen on D1 is hanging from the Bishop on G4, so we have to play Queen C2, and then Queen G1 takes the Rook, and now the best move according to Stockfish is Queen to D2. And the reason for that is of course it's threatening Queen to G5 and attacking those dark squares, uh, what's interesting is the slightly more instinctual move, at least for me, was to move that queen from c2 to e4 and centralize it. But then I realized that move doesn't make a ton of logical sense, because there is this queen on g1 pinning that bishop to the rook, and our eventual final solution for development is going to have to involve developing the bishop to the diagonal on b2 so that the rook gets into play instead of developing our bishop this way, because we can't develop our bishop this way because it will hang the rook. So queen d2 is the best square for the queen, so we should put our, our queen on the best square for itself, forcing the move g captures f6, and then finally play b3 with the idea of bishop b2. And after bishop h5, bishop b2, white is fully consolidated, and according to the engine, this should just be decisive advantage white. White is up a piece, and of course, uh, eventually white will start attacking himself. You know, white will start attacking on his own, and the white king is in a position of relative safety. So kind of a crazy line there. Uh, but if we go back to this f takes e5, two other knight moves here, uh, two other moves have been tried, both of which are moving the knight on f6, and those are, of course, the moves you're much more likely to encounter. One move is this move knight to g4, 
And after bishop to b5, this should just simply be decisive advantage white. And of course, the other move is a little bit more complicated, this move knight to d5, after which uh, bishop to g5 is apparently major advantage white. And we do have one stem game here. We have this Petra versus Jerka that was played back in 2008 that continued with pawn to f6, e takes f6, and now the move that was played in the game was g takes f6, but if knight takes f6, according to the engine, uh, white would have an advantage after queen e2 check, queen e7, and then simply castles queenside should be major advantage white. So going back, uh, we have this move g takes f6 that was played in the game, and then we have bishop c4 continuing the attack, bishop e6, queen e2, and then we have queen f7, and I am going to show the finish of this game because it was actually a really play well played game, and it did have a nice finish. Uh, it went queen to e4, knight f4, bishop e6, knight e6, castles kingside, getting that attack down the f-file, and now, of course, white isn't really down any material, and he's attacking the black king sort of for free. Uh, we have this king to g7 takes, rook e8, uh, we have takes on g5, uh, king h1 just sidestepping the threats on d4 while still simultaneously threatening the g5 pawn. Black tries to hold g5, white holds his pawn on d4, white just gains some space, and then, finally, white decides to break through. He captures the pawn on g5, just getting rid of the last bit of pawn cover around the black king in exchange for a piece. We have rook f1, rook f1, hg5, and now queen e5 begins the final attack against the black king, making all kinds of mate threats with rook f7, uh, taking that piece, and then going after the king with the final onslaught, queen f7, and then a very cute rook sacrifice to end the game. Pause the video, see if you can find it. Uh, after g3 check, king h3, we sacrifice the rook, uh, rook to h6 check, queen captures, and then queen f5 check, the idea being that after pawn to g4, we're going to have queen f1 mate. So very cute finish to a very well-played game that was Petra versus uh, Jerka, played back in 2008. So that's kind of uh, what we do in these situations where they don't move the bishop back. We do everything with tempo. But when they preempt us by moving the bishop back, it's not actually favorable for us to play pawn to d4 anymore. And it's a little complicated to understand why. The reason is, is black hasn't made any knight moves yet. And yes, that actually matters. Because now when they play e takes d4, c takes d4, we don't have e5 to attack a knight on the f6 square. We're not doing that with tempo anymore. And it's black's move here. He doesn't have to move a knight. He can just develop a bishop. He can play bishop to g4 and create this pin. And he's got all of these threats here. He's threatening d5. He's threatening f5. The d4 pawn is under attack, and we're going to have to defend that probably very awkwardly. So this is probably uh, just at, le at the very least complete equality or maybe even slight edge black after bishop to g4. So we should avoid this possibility. We don't want to play d4 right away after they've played bishop b6. So what should we do? Well, we should play knight to a3. The idea is, again, very similar to other lines. We're trying to bring the knight to c4 so that we can get rid of the dark squared bishop, which has now given us, uh, the dark squared bishop has now given us its address. We know that it's on b6, so we're going to play knight to c4, which will attack that dark squared bishop and also simultaneously attack the pawn on e5. So what is black going to play here? Well, black has kind of two moves here. Black can play the hyper-aggressive move, pawn to f5, which is actually the move that I recommend in a video where I talk about playing the king's gambit declined with black. f5 is a great move for black to play, but of course we do need to know how to meet it as white, and I will cover that in a minute. And the other move that black can play is black can just make a normal developing move, which is by far and away the move that you're going to see the most often. Now, if they play a normal developing move, you should just capture on e5, captures, and then knight to c4. And, of course, you're attacking that ever-critical bishop on b6, but you're also attacking, you're double-attacking the pawn on the e5 square. And so the rest of how you need to handle this really has a lot to do uh, with just making forced moves as they kind of become forced. You know, if black plays a normal move here and doesn't do anything... You're going to just take the bishop, uh, you know, maybe play d3 to defend the pawn on e4, and you're going to have some sort of advantage. So he should take this pawn on e4. And now you're going to start going down a forced line here. If you play uh, the move, uh, you just have to play accurately. Uh, in the past, move the move knight b6 has been played. The move I actually recommend is queen e2. Queen e2 appears to be a little bit more accurate than knight to b6. 
And we are going to start getting into a really long, kind of complicated computer line here. But this is how it goes. So bishop to f5. And now we do have a previous game in this line that didn't go well for white. Somebody tried the move pawn to g4 here, which is very principled. It's very logical. Uh, it just didn't work out for them. And actually, the computer still gives slight edge white after g4. So g4 is worth exp exploring. It was his move right after this that was apparently an inaccuracy. Uh, and this was uh, Valesky versus uh, Mur Murav uh, played back in 2012. And I probably just butchered those names. But g4 was an idea. Probably better was d3 right away was probably better. Just pawn to d3. And then we're going to get into this computer analysis here. We're going to have bishop f2 check, king to d1, pawn to f6, and now g4. So the, the idea is still g4, this distraction. Uh, if you don't see how this works, you can't really take on g4 because the knight is going to be hanging. This knight on e4 is going to be hanging to the queen. So you have to do something else. You have to play bishop to g6. And now the idea is knight on c takes e5, f e5, knight e5, with the idea of targeting this bishop on g6 so that the knight is hanging. And notice a lot of black stuff is hanging. So we sacrificed a piece, but a lot of black pieces are hanging. Of course, our king is in the middle of the board, which is a little uncomfortable, but we're not too far away from fixing that. So castle's king side, knight g6, rook e8. And now our queen is in the line of fire. But more importantly, our king is also pinned. And apparently the, the bigger problem to solve is the kingpin. So king to c2 is correct. And this is supposed to be major advantage white. And again, big long force continuation here. Knight g3 picking up that exchange. Queen f2, knight takes h1, queen to f3, h takes g6. And then according to the engine, you're supposed to grab this extra pawn. You're supposed to play queen takes b7. And then after knight d7, finally take the knight on the h1 square. And I guess we'll just have to believe the engine assessment here, where it says that the two bishops uh, and the uh, couple of pawns and, you know, the position that we have, it gives major advantage white. It says that this is major advantage white. I I'm a little bit more, I'm a little less enthusiastic, I think, maybe slight edge white. It's, it's a hard position to assess. It's actually very unclear still, but obviously white's doing pretty good. Uh, Black's king isn't particularly safe. There's two open files. There's a wide open light square diagonal. White does have the bishop pair, which I like. Uh, black is currently up on exchange, but white has a couple of pawns for that. So it should be at least slight edge white, uh, but somewhere between slight edge and major advantage white. Like I said, stockfish does give major advantage white here. So if we uh, go back to this knight a3 move, that's what we do against knight f6. So then the big question is, what do we do if they do play uh, the move that I recommend, uh, which is this move, pawn to f5? What is the correct line according to theory? Well, we should play f takes e5, and they're going to play d takes e5, and then we should play d4. And again, this is just in fitting with the principles of the position. We need to just block that diagonal. And then the best move according to theory is e takes d4. And then in this previous game, uh, this Vales again, Valeska versus Sokolov in this case, uh, went pawn to e5, and e5 was apparently a question mark move, although, I mean, it looks super logical, and it is a really complicated position, but apparently the best move was bishop to g5, which the computer gives as slight edge white, so this is the path that we need to go down. We need to play bishop g5, and after knight f6, we're going to have pawn to e5, pawn to h6, e takes f6, uh, h takes g5, f takes g7, queen e7 check, queen to e2, rook to g8, knight to d4, uh, queen takes e2, bishop takes e2, and apparently this position should be uh, some sort of slight edge white. The last couple of moves given here by the engine are rook to g7, and then simply knight to c4, finally picking up that bishop pair, finally going after that bishop on b6, and white's apparently consolidated enough that he can declare that he has some sort of slight advantage. And this is the path that we apparently need to go down. So anyways, that's how we meet all of these things in the Queen's Gambit to, in the King's Gambit declined. So again, to review, uh, after they play the King's Gambit declined, we need to put pressure on the e5 square and cover h4. We need to play pawn to c3, going for that big center. And then against any knight move, either knight c6 or knight to f6, we're going to play d4 and e5 with tempo. And if they play uh, this best move, bishop to b6, we're going to play knight to a3. 
And of course, on uh, knight to f6, we're going to exchange. We're going to play knight to c4. After they take here, we're going to go into this long forcing continuation beginning with queen e2 and remembering to play d3 at the critical juncture. And actually, even if you play g4 instead of d3, as long as you follow up with d3, it's supposed to be correct or pretty close to correct. So that was the main thing that got missed uh, in the game where g4 was played previously. And uh, finally, if they play uh, this absolute scary, complicated line beginning with f5, the line that we need to go down is fe5 takes d4, and then at this critical juncture, the way that we're going to get an advantage with white is to play this very critical bishop to g5 move, and these complications are supposed to lead to slight advantage white. So anyways, I hope you found this video helpful, I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.